Hello, everybody. This is the What is on the Tabletop podcast, and my guest today has it all. The looks, the skills, and a dog. Please introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Steve Famine, and, uh, or Steve, anything works realistically. I didn't expect the dog intro that, that took me off guard. I had a, had a quick laugh there. But, so I, I found this podcast, What is on the Tabletop, and immediately I was like, uh, I don't know, this, uh, I was just excited to sit down and uh, and talk with you, and I went through all of your content basically while painting a few weeks ago, and I was just like, "All right, this sounds like a cool podcast to jump onto." And I remember I reached out to you, and you were like, "Sure, let's do it up." So I'm uh, I'm glad to be your uh, your monthly uh, guest and the the invite. It's much appreciated. Uh, I'm yes, with how you set this up, it's pretty professional. So. Oh Jesus! Oh my! Stop it, you! Stop! <laughs> Gonna start this... start with the compliments and start with the shout outs, and then we can yeah. Actually... About yeah. Oh, okay. Really and the, and then you start trash talking me. Okay. Okay. No. Let's do this. We'll build you up and then we'll break you down. No, really, <laughs> oh. Really oh. Really. Okay. 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 I, I have. Uh, so then I have no regrets to uh, sh shoot the first the first gun because I took a deep dive through your I Instagram and I found a tag that I have not seen in. Close to a century? No, no, close to a decade. That is the correct word. Close to a decade, right. and that is the tech Mage Knight. Oh yeah, actually, that's uh, that's what got me into the hobby. Effectively, was uh, playing Mage Knight at my local comic store because the uh, the Games Workshop nearby those uh, those prices were a little bit atrocious for uh, someone in like elementary school or uh, like under the age of ten. Mage Knight reeled you in for Games Workshop. I'm now now I'm bath more. I, because I, I, I talked to you about Mage Knight for the entire hour, but uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> actually, I've, I, I'm I'm not sure if I would regret that or not because I uh, played it at a trade show, and I, I was very young at the time, uh, and uh, yes, it it was interesting. Actually, it has uh, a mechanic that is in Warhammer right now, and that is having different profiles uh, after you're taking a certain amount of damage. So what's fascinating is it's actually a really well-designed game. Um, I actually rewrote like the rules that I'm on like a really niche hobby forum where I talk about Mage Knight with other people and like I post on the Reddit and... Uh, all right, this is we'll just go down the rabbit hole immediately. Um, let's jump. Right. Let's jump right let's jump down. I'm very interested stuff. about this. Well, Warhammer is cool, and I have but... five armies, <laughs> and, and like I have all this terrain for it. <laughs> Mage Knight is like the the original, uh, kind of what dragged me in. And specifically, besides they're all pre-painted, terrible quality from China, they're still under them. They're Ralph Partha mostly sculpted miniatures, and he's the metal, uh, like one of the main primary, kind of like the Perry twins. Ralph Partha is like the main fantasy trope, late 90s, early 2000s. He had like a 10-year run of just like back-to-back -back awesome fantasy sculpts. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he sculpted thousands of like heroic fantasy miniatures. So you've probably seen his stuff. Probably, but uh, the name actually does not ring a bell. Okay, but what's uh, what's fascinating is uh, he's, uh, I think, part of Ironwind Metals. I think he even did some of the Mech Warrior stuff. Like, it's, it's, he's just done, like, so much. He's a very productive or prolific person, you could say. But in any case, uh, it's, what is it, Jordan Wiseman, who's now, like, a professor out in California, uh, made the game Mage Knight with another buddy. I think he went to, like, an IHOP, and he was like, what if you had a clicky base? Like, it's actually a funny origin story of how they made the game. Because they were like, how do we make, like, people like booster packs? And that's how the game made money. Because otherwise, Mage Knight was one of those games where, like, the unique or the chase or the rare figures were worth the money, but everything else is worth, like, 10 cents, 25 cents. Like, it's not worth a lot of money. So you would just pull, oh, let me open up eight boosters, and you might get two or three figures that are useful. However, as a hobbyist, these figures are actually really nicely sculpted, but they just gunked the paint on them. So for when I was playing Frostgrave, that's probably where you saw the Mage Knight tag. I used a lot of those fantasy miniatures, took them off the bases, and then repainted them up. And they're great quality, like skeletons and zombies and orcs. They actually look great. Yeah, I was actually really tempted, but I, well, did not buy the boosters because, well, it was it's a little uh, bit expensive. the... Yeah, it was expensive and it was uh, the, the booster concept. You just bought a booster of miniatures and you would not get the miniature you wanted. 
so from being a kid, I couldn't buy like it's not like Magic the Gathering where I could just go to a website and buy the single miniature I needed. You would have to wait for one to appear on eBay or something. And also, I was a kid without a credit card, so I couldn't you know afford any of that. Also, it, way way back, the internet was yeah. very young around that time. We were using like those pro board forums, the old uh, what do you call GeoCities? It was the really really old style websites. People would post blogs about like here's my Mage Knight like uh, like site or whatever, and they had these old forums that were like ancient looking, and people would like post on there and everything. So you actively played Mage Knight? I'm surprised. Yeah, I was uh, <laughs> one of the best players in my state, only because I was, you know, an 11 year old. Only because our local comic shop ran something, and the entry fee—it was like a weekly, every Thursday night thing at Hall of Heroes at like a mall nearby. And what was fascinating was it was the entry fee was just buy one booster pack, so it'd be six dollars and ninety-five cents or something like that. You'd buy a booster pack, it gives you like four or five figures, and then that's fine. But you'd use probably the same army, kind of like Warhammer. Um, I used the same army for about two years at the local store. Maybe I would change out one figure or two. But instead of playing the meta, you can actually just find like a competitive list and keep running that if you knew what to do with it. So I just found one combination I liked and played with that. And then uh, until like a new edition or a new expansion came out where I was sort of forced to change my army over time. But uh, what's fascinating was, yeah, it was like a weekly thing. I would go see my friends, and a few of those guys, what's hilarious is uh, they're now like 40, and they have kids and like own a house and stuff, and, also, and they also evolved to Warhammer. And that was some weird thing where I saw my first Warhammer game because after a Mage Knight tournament happened at the local comic shop, the guys were like, it was like Veterans Night, where the older players would like crack out the armies, and I remember seeing like really badly painted orcs against like Space Marines or something. <laughs> <laughs> during what would be third edition 40k and at the time i was like wait this is i remember going to a games workshop and just uh, i remember epic was out in the glass cases like it was 2004 something like that i don't or i was very small um but i was just fascinated by like oh this is i can i can play with toys and there's like complicated rules and i was enjoying mage knight because um I guess I was like winning some, or it was like the first game I played in person. Like I've played video games online with people, but this was the first time I like played in front of other people that wasn't like a sport or something school related. Uh, kind of like if you've ever played like Pokemon cards as a kid, it was like a whole community thing to play that at the local whatever comic shop and like trade and shit talk and whatever else. Yeah, so, that... I don't know. That got me into the, like the vibe of like having a local store and then having like a local community player base that was like instilled in me. As like a ten year old or something. Huh. And was, and know. and from and from there the 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 story went on and on and on and on. I, because as I see I started making terrain basically yeah. for like Mage Knight stuff, and then as it evolved, I was always way better at terrain than actually painting miniatures. Like I only recently became like tabletop quality in painting figures. It was a it was a long struggle. <laughs> Yet I was the Oh, Usu sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Yeah, usually I uh, talk with my guests about um, their process and their time management, but you have also a YouTube channel, and I watched... under the same name as Steve Famine, and also you being an audio person, uh, I'm terrible at editing, and I do apologize ahead of time. No, no, but, uh, the, I the audio editing is trash. <laughs> Not I'll, I'll I, apparently not so bad that I had to turn it off um, <laughs> because I listened to it and you were doing a very fine job of explaining of how much time a, a a piece takes and what time you actually spend on it and uh, what the result is, what techniques you use. So I think uh, if anyone is interested in your working process, uh, your YouTube channel is the way to go. Absolutely. And that's one of the things where I'm still not exactly sure my style, but again, like what we're talking right here or a few of my videos, I like the more laid back style where I can ramble and then also explain things more in depth. And that's something in general. I like podcasts or audiobooks because I don't, it's just uh, while it is effective to have a here's seven quick ways to do like these terrain hacks or something like that, while that is effective for a new person to watch, there's not a lot there's not a lot of content on the terrain side for um for like higher higher level professional stuff or like just talking about like just mass producing terrain or like a variety of different subjects but 
most of the subjects are just like, here's how I quickly painted my table, or I did this for cheap, or stuff like that. Well, that's good content. I wanted to do a more casual, like, I'm just going to talk about, like, uh, people that are working on huge projects, or, like, how they made the Warhammer World Tables. Yes. Or, like, a, I, don't, I don't know, like, I'm more interested in, like, the, yeah, let's, uh, like, I would want to do a podcast to talk to the Zorpa Zorp guy, because he has, like, I don't know, some 14 foot by 10 foot Lord of the Rings table. I just want to talk to the guy about, like, the, whatever was going through his head when he was doing that, because I watched all the videos, and that's, I don't know, I, I like the, uh, like, the, the interesting characters that are in our like hobby kind of a biome or zone yeah of and it, so, uh, or people some... that just tackle crazy projects where you're just like you're doing what now that's a <laughs> uh, that's because i have a i have a chaos warhound titan i'm gonna make terrain out of and everyone's like what that's crazy and i'm like no 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 no. this has been done by like 50 other people don't worry about it Oh yes, uh, we are in a very comfortable uh, comfortable position that everything has been kind of sortish done before. There is a lot of output by a lot of talented people, and some of them uh, even go uh, the whole nine yards to make uh, tutorials how they did it. And uh, yes, it is just a rich treasure chest of... And that's the thing with Instagram specifically. Like, Pinterest is terrible. And actually forums, like, I have a blog on, like, Daka Daka. It's one of the wargaming forums. And it, while it has, like, a lot of posts and it has some views, it's uh, it's very slow going compared to on Instagram. It's like, yeah, I, I can just, like, search for different terrain things or, like, look under the Necromunda hashtag and I can see thousands of different like artists and whatever else and that's something where oh you want to say you're an artist and be creative and original most of my creativity comes from i just inhale a ton of other people's artwork and then pick things i like from it like uh that's like i talked to narb makes he's another youtuber and uh I, like i talked to eric a few times from like eric's hobby workshop and both of them are just like oh i like most of your ideas i'm going to be stealing those from now on like like they'll like uh I think Eric's Hobby Workshop recently posted a video where he had some Blood Angels. He uh, like boosted up on uh, like jump packs, and he just like it was like a casual thirty minutes while he like converted some Marines. I immediately now also have a ten man like assault jump pack squad. I, I uh, didn't paint them, <laughs> prime them, but it was like I built them up kind of based off that. Where I was like, yeah, you know, what? I always kind of wanted to do that, and I have those unbuilt just sitting around. So let me jump into that. Like it's you take the other artists produce good stuff. And then, oh, this guy made a huge table. Ah, I can make my table a little bigger. Sure, that looks cool. Oh, I like that bridge over the water. I'm going to steal that. Like Most of my work is from inspired by someone else. So I write it down on my phone or on a note, and I'm like, I'll do that later on. Yeah, Kinda like, I oh, think sorry. I quoted that uh, way back in, in some other podcast. Um, you steal from one guy, it's... Um... You steal from the whole person. Scene is it's, like that, uh, where it's just like this guy's awesome. I'm gonna copy that. Yeah, you you steal from one guy. It's a uh, um, pl uh, plagiation. Is that the right word? I think so. Uh, you steal from ten guys. You are inspired. You t steal from uh, one hundred guys. You're a genius. Yep. Uh, I mean, that the, uh, that, the that is the way to go. Steve Jobs or whatever that made the iPhone. Um, he just took stole from a like. He had a hundred engineers working for him or more. They made the idea and everything work. And then he's like, hey, look what I made, guys. Like... That is actually a legit uh, way to be an artist. Just oh, to, yeah. just to say, um, there is a uh, guy, he got famous uh, because he was married to a adult film actress and okay. he made uh, sculptures of him and his wife in the way of well them uh, enjoying each other's company very very much and he was a guy who really just uh, had a workshop and said hey can you make this for me i have this idea and that idea and uh, the, uh, well crafty craftsman uh, made it for him yeah I'm, it, uh, that's, just... I don't know. That, that's also something wild where, like, if depending on who you bounce off of locally, because I have, uh, I talk to the best, there's only like two guys in my entire, like, city or area that paint better than me that I'm aware of that I've, like, spoken to. And both of them, we just talk about there's, like, this big hole locally where there's, like, not painters you can, like, meet up with and paint together. The thing is, though, uh, 
I mean, well, then you should go online. Like, you should interact with other artists so you can, you just massively improve. It's like having, like, some kind of special item that levels you up quicker. Just interacting with other, uh, with other artists. And also, just like, hey, I got an idea for this. Can I hire you for this portion of a job? Like, uh, I have a good relationship with a friend where I, uh, I basically, he, I painted two of his armies as commissions, and I was like, I'm sorry, I'm not painting any more commissions for about the next two years. And he's like, well, where do I go? So I recommended him to a friend, and now they're best buds, and they'll, they'll hang out. <laughs> and, uh, he, painted, he painted an army for him, and uh, I've looked at the pictures, it looks great, and I'm like, all right, this, uh, this seemed to have worked out, but I made a new relationship where it's like, that guy will probably paint for him, but also... We'll talk about color schemes or processes or how to cut time down or like what he should re-highlight and vice versa. Like it's just talking about a thing gets you more interested in the thing. But also when you meet or talk to other artists, it's it's very fun to actually just be like, oh, I got actual questions. I remember, um, I think it was like Miscast and I know a mini maniac. I like randomly DM'd him or sent him a message where I was like, oh, I got a question about this. And they just like responded immediately. And I was like, oh, I didn't think you'd talk to other artists at all. Like, I just kind of just <laughs> didn't respond. Anyway. Yeah, it, it, it is. Um, but it was it, nice that it's like, hey, I'm into art too, dude. Of course I'm going to talk to you. Like, I'm not going to be snobby about it. Like, obviously, if you're if you're talking about. Yeah, like, yeah. Z- zero. About Mage Knight, I'll talk to you about Mage Knight. It's like. <laughs> Zero, zero divas, zero snobs in this community. Uh, people that have very, very limited time, yes, but people just ignoring you, I have not run into one so far. And uh, no, I'm, not I'm really. like, there's, there's some drama, but most of it's based on like the staying on like the Twitter stuff. And like, it's you don't really, if you're a painter, you're not really interacting with that. That's more of like the actual like players and like the, the actual like community online and stuff. Yeah, and it is really nice to have just a very casual and nice conversa- conversation with the person you look up to. It is like so ju- just uh, answering to one of their stories and they hitting you back immediately and suddenly you're in a little conversation and like, wow, this is a very cool girl or dude I'm just talking yeah. with right now and they are so above my skill level. And I feel, <laughs> I feel, I, I, I feel so happy that they are talking to me and yeah, it, it is very, very nice. It, I had it, a, yeah in the community but to pull it a little bit back to what you are doing and i Um, just uh, throw up your uh, table uh the warhammer table you made uh, a modular table yep and um you made also a youtube video about it what I wanted to know because I was sure. running in a problem recently uh, because in my local gaming club uh, a crusade campaign is running and I for the last well three years was only running a, a kill team campaign. What this means to me is that I was very used to set up terrain for skirmish games. And now these uh, two other players were asking me how I like the terrain. And I just looked at the terrain and was like, oh, yeah, that's a bit lackluster. But then it came to my head, like, oh, yes, armies have to move through that terrain. I cannot have little alleyways and uh, corners and uh, a lot of buildings obstructing that. And um, you have a very... Uh, well. You have this planned out table, and what interested me, um, does this table work 100% for you like you intended it, or was there like a situation where like, oh, well, that does not work at all, like I had it in my mind, or there is something that there's an obstruction or a way that... uh, um, does not work, because it is a very, very pretty table. And you, well, one can see the enormous effort you put into it. But uh, as I said, I, from I myself, have lost the eye for uh, army movement totally. All right. So this is a this is a fun question for me. Um, think about it as if uh, have you ever made used map editors for a, like a real time strategy game or any kind of video game? 
very very long time ago i think okay. that it must have been the first command and conqueror like, map editor. command and conquer age of empires anything like that if you used like a map editor yeah um so there's there's kind of this so i've also created a ton of maps for different games and it's something where it's not just a visual aesthetic or a gut feeling where you're like this looks right i'm gonna put these trees here um you make it kind of for playability and it's you kind of have to what's the best way to explain this there's two different things there's terrain pieces then there's uh doodads i call them or basically scatter terrain so uh you probably went through my instagram and saw the uh the drop zone commander city i did yes like and i will talk uh, you can talk to uh, talk about it right now but, uh, or i will talk idea, to you about same it idea later. with the 40k table it was okay. basically i was like all right i'm gonna write a list of things that worked so i planned out the 40k table step by step completely before i even started painting anything i just collected materials and i wrote like a five page checklist of like things i wanted but also how i would get there step by step so like i already knew how to like paint the white looking concrete that was corroded like six months earlier in the process than when i actually had to do that step however planning out stuff like this i was like what do i want um i want the basically it to be a modular table so right now it's fitting like uh it's like eight inches by uh like the four feet by two feet it fits into a little tiny area i wanted it to stack and be modular okay so that was like one of the primary stipulations that i have it was like absolutely have to make it modular i live in a small cindy uh, city condominium in like philadelphia i don't have a ton of room to place an eight by four table that would take up my whole like living room for example however i was like all right modular step one i have to do that what looks good well in the drop zone commander table i had diagonal roads and that made playing a game on the table fascinating and i made another city table years ago same thing if you make a cookie cutter like a graph almost of a city table kind of like the normal tournament official terrain like mdf kind of tables you'll see pictures of where all the streets are exactly like in 90 degree angles if you make a table uh it just makes you when you're playing the game of warhammer or kill team it makes you stand around walk around the table look at different line of sights it uh it just makes everything much more pleasing and aesthetic to have those diagonal lines going down and picture them as like lanes of fire while i can place terrain on them and all of the modular terrain because the only thing if you noticed and i could send you pictures of that it's a completely flat board except some of the inbuilt industrial sections alongside some of the hills and like that one little trench area filled with trash most of it is actually completely flat where you can stand figures almost on anything so while i made it for playability and for being modular so i could store it i made it so figures aren't gonna fall down on the hills or slopes or anything and it's just a big flat board and that's how it stacks together on top of i add the modular terrain and the actual pieces themselves on top to play around and the roads kind of give you an outline aesthetically and it looks like i'm adding like i'm placing the roads down i'm not and you can cover them but it gives you fun lanes of fire where you have to think about the board differently instead of like oh my tank can just see straight ahead and then to the left or the right street now it's like well everyone's driving my like armored column is driving at like an angle it kind of just mixes stuff up visually and it makes it look way better. Yeah, so you, um, well, basically kept uh, it very, very simple. And uh, the fun starts when you actually put your terrain on it. Yeah, so I kept a really simple plan. And then I was like, all right, I'm going to add doodads, which I mentioned that term before. And it's basically just the scatter terrain with the little details. Like, oh, in this little hole over here, it's like a bag, a barrel, and like a few like piles of like trash or junk. And that's something where it's the little details you can always add on later. And you can paint them bright colors. And then you can, like, you can, your eyes will look in and be like, wow, this is so detailed. When in actuality, the, the video I made about it, I just stressed where I was like, so this didn't become a year-long project it was still a seven month project i kept it as simple as possible where i was like let's back to basics i was going to do like a monorail like a raised train scratch that idea completely out i was like we're not doing this that's going to be far too complicated i was going to have more magnets to use magnets for terrain and stuff i cut that idea and was like eh, it's unnecessary i don't need to add that on so i kept basically writing ideas down working on the project and then taking ideas away you mentioned that everything is flat and the well for the obvious cause that uh, models can stand on it uh, without falling over except I... some of the industrial section but yeah that that's also 
there's the six by four table and then to make it the eight by four that industrial section with the white tank and like the road leading up to it that's more of a put your killed models here or for kill team and necromunda i make the board small and then i use that for uh like the smaller skirmish kind of games it's more of like it looks pretty and uh in most 40k games that's just where you're gonna like you know put your rule book and put your stuff to the side but that's also my bread and butter for necromunda zona alpha star grave like multiple games i could play in that little section yeah i have become a little more daring when it comes to angles and hills because the practical way to go was to build your hills like a staircase so nothing falls off and right now um at least the games workshop customers are in the comfortable position that all their models are plastic and you do not oh, yeah. have no to more, no more metal rolling down yeah downstairs. no more no yeah. more metal rolling down the hill doing the clunk 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 mostly i have i think you've seen my painted tyranids i have a basically a retro metal third edition tyranid army uh ironically that's the whole story in itself but uh that's the those fall over all the time the big metal card effects as i have have you ever painted like the old one eye or i think you i think i saw that on your uh, profile you had some old metal bugs they're terrible to stand up oh yes i i'm a uh well turned player since 1997 so right. i got a few years on me yeah About i years on me. <laughs> i enjoyed all the pros and cons of owning turned models yeah I, uh, I basically have my current army right now so i inherited like a lot of the metal models came from like, another friend that uh, plays the game mina from uh, the old tyranid hive forums i used to post onto and that's something i don't know if you ever were on those that's like the red and black uh, tyranid form from back in the day um just called the tyranid hive but that was a fun form Oh no no! I was or actually. Shadow, I think is the other one. Yeah yeah, I was actually just a part of Daka Daka, and yep. there there were b before my English skills improved. I was part of uh, two German uh, forum communities, and I only glimpsed a little bit into what was it um, the. Uh, Bolter and Chainsaw, yeah. and a lot of Warhammer forms had these terrible black backgrounds, so it was impossible. Oh yes, <laughs> like, like it was it was Warp Shadow, Tyrion and Hive, Bolter and Chainsaw. There was like yeah. multiple forms where you'd get on it and be like, "This is hurting my eyes." Like, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, that's where you had to go for hobby content before they had uh, you know either Facebook or Instagram or whatever else. Yes. But um, talking back on the uh, the board itself, another thing is I actually kept it. Uh, this was a project where I was like, I don't really care how much money I spend within reason. So like one of the early things I was planning was to buy like one of each game's workshop kit and then recast them in resin. And I was like, that'll cost more money than it's actually worth. And if I want to have this table for many years, I actually like the durability of the game's workshop plastics. Like it's actually really nice where it's just like, oh, this like the Promethean pipe set is like indestructible. It's not going to break <laughs> Yes, uh, I I've, I've run into uh, some uh, problems there with the industrial uh, terrain with the ladders because they are only fit in at, at one point, and uh, if you are not careful, these ladders will break off very easily, and there are uh, some chains and tubes. Oh, that yeah, will, the chains the chains broke off. I'll yeah, it they will they will suffer the same fate. So right now, um, the uh, industrial uh, terrain in my hobby in my ga uh, gaming club is stored away. And is that the one you have pictured on your Instagram? The, uh, yes. the Rust Riza kind of Mars looking one. Yeah, I I uh, wanted to have it uh, to look like it is well this Mars look, but not the cracked Earth, but just everything is covered in thick red dust. And you see, no, it it just covers everything. You have no, you have no detail. You, it is just everything is, uh, is this ah. red desert. And of course, uh, some other club members who are very proficient in painting uh, immediately made some suggestions for the, some lights and other stuff. And I said, yeah, you can do that because I'm done with this. I'm not touching this anymore. If you want to paint any detail in this, I have. 
three cardboard box, big cardboard boxes right now with this terrain and knock yourself out. And this that's is really serviceable. Inclu oh, sorry to interrupt. This is really. I'm looking at the one you posted from about seven weeks ago on the uh, for your kill team board, and uh, the middle piece is great, and then the side pieces they're really serviceable. Well, that's a lot of terrain. You just spread them out a little bit, and then it's fine for 40k. Uh, yeah. A lot of the 40k people, it's more of the tournament mindset of like, hey, this isn't the ETC uh, or like whatever uh, exact format that we use for tournaments. And you're like, realistically, I don't know, 40k should be a beer and pretzels like enjoyable game where it's you're having like a narrative on a battlefield. It should look pretty and terrain mixes it up like that's the thing. I, I played War Machine for years. I skipped 40k 6th and 7th edition to play uh, War Machine and it was mostly terrible due to the absolute lack of terrain, or they would just cut out circles. as like, this is a patch of trees. It's a cutout circle. And just in general, that was, like, disheartening. So yeah, that, for, like, that this is... terrain, I'd rather pay on a cool-looking, junk, red, Mars-looking, like, like space base table than uh, on a bunch of unpainted MDF uh, L-shaped shitty room at the city room. Yeah, you know what I've, I mean. Like, yeah, yeah, I, t I totally understand you. I'm in, I'm in the, in the same corner, and uh, well, it, it gives me a, a tiny bit of a headache because uh, the most of the 40k players are also in a way more competitive mindset. Not all are yep. uh, aspiring tournament players, but. Uh, some of them really um, it's the same thing put 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 a little a, a little bit too harsh on an eye when it comes to uh, well the table has to look like this or the table has to look like that. It, uh, it's the, the same people in multiplayer games where they're like, I don't want to play this one map. Uh, say it's like yes. a first person shooter game. I don't want to play this one map. Why? Oh, it's too big. I want to only play the twenty four seven. We only yeah. play the one. Everything small has map. to be symmetrical. Yeah, everything's uh, symmetrical. Uh, that's actually a complaint I've had. Uh, so I've only had a few games on my table, and one of the immediate complaints was just like a, oh man, you're gonna burn out on this board because it's not a. It's like the same map every time. And uh, I just linked you a flat picture of it. It's actually a completely flat board that you could basically add any terrain on. Like it was something that was like, no, 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 you don't. You ignore the roads. We can put terrain other places, and the boards break apart and then flip to other sides. Like it's like this isn't. This, this, I can get years and years out of this, but their immediate response was, it's like, well, I also know the, the like, the, not the inches, but, like, I know which corner to deploy at, this and that, and it's like, it's not as big as of an advantage as you're thinking with your 12-vehicle uh, parking lot army. Yeah, it, it, it <laughs> actually, a trap I fell into, too. When I first saw the table, I was like, okay, you're not getting a lot of mileage out of that, but after seeing that uh, the terrain, pe well, it is basically a very nice surface and you have the all the terrain pieces separately and that makes for well and, endless and I, fun and i keep like adding terrain to it like now i have some giant tree that fits awkwardly right in the middle and it's like yeah this works when it works yes um god damn right, it now it. now now i lost my train i i i had oh yes right. and now i remember because Sorry, um man. we're, we're really jumping around so. yeah you you are uh, are you falling into a terrain building trap like, okay, now I start this system, now I build terrain for it, now I build a table for it, now I start this system because on your uh, Instagram so we have around oh, yeah. four different gaming systems with tables. I think I, I, think table. I built like four tables in the, like, during quarantine or something, or three. So uh, actually... That sounds about right. Um, I built a desert table with a friend to teach him terrain. Oh, well, actually, uh, fun fact. So I moderate and sort of run the terrain building Reddit. It has like almost 100k people. But uh, like, you know how there's like Warhammer 40k or like there's different subreddits. Uh, if you ever use the site Reddit, the yeah, terrain course. building one, I moderate and post on it. And that's something where it's, oh, I'm checking this website every day to moderate posts and clean them up. However... Um, then looking at terrain every day, commenting on other people's work. So it's just like really reinforced where I'm spending an hour a day probably thinking about or like browsing pictures of terrain and then working on it most of the rest of the week if I'm not painting miniatures. And honestly, I have a thousand miniatures to paint right now. But like That's probably an accurate number. Um, all I want to do is make terrain still. Like it's the only thing I haven't burned out on and it's definitely a hobby pitfall where like, I volunteered to run the local Frostgrave scene, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with what Frostgrave is. But it's, I'm familiar uh, with Frostgrave, yes. Yeah, it's a lovely rule set. 
Stargrave is pretty cool. That's another system I will jump into. Oh boy. <laughs> um, How could you weird. not? A Stargrave is literally I buy a rule book and then I can play that on my table with like 40k guard miniatures. Like it's it's very easy to jump into that actually. Same thing with Frostgrave. I literally was like perfect. I could take Mage Knight miniatures, I could turn them into like different war brands, and then I can just I like I don't have to buy anything except a rule book. That's amazing. And for the, the anyway. Not talking about how good the game is because it's great. James McLeod guy or whatever else is a is a genius in that sense of like make it very simple and it works great and I just like that style. Yes, so anyway, uh, now, one, uh, one of now, the now I lost my train of thought. But, yeah, uh, one of my first <laughs> one of my first terrain builds was uh, f actually for Gaslands because I, I uh, made uh, well some for it is meant to played uh, with uh, well matchbox cars or mattel cars the little, little toy cars and uh, i am in the comfortable position to upsize the uh, uh, the materials for that and i basically made three teams an orc team a gene stealer cult team and a space marine team to play gaslands with but i actually have not played it um what it's came okay. out um, the <laughs> I, when the sure. when the orc orc buggies dropped they dropped a little gaming system to drive around with it and I tried that out with a friend and Im immediately changed the rules a little bit to fit uh, the three different teams but uh, then speed freaks that was the yeah, name of the, the speed freaks uh, yeah. I played yeah, played a little bit cars. speed freaks with that terrain and uh, yeah now these. Uh, they these uh, stones uh, and uh, stone pillars were really in the old tradition of well you just stack styrofoam on top of each other cut in a little bit dry brush it and f from that day on terrain building was very much a well re relaxing. It's uh, terrain building lovely because you, you don't have to be a perfectionist about it unless you're yes. actually making some some like award-winning paint thing but it's the fact that like i could just really casually be like oh let me put some like plaster stuff down i'll stick some tires and a barrel in there let me do like it's it's you can make mistakes you can paint it i love dry brushing and washes i don't know if you notice my paint style i'm very dirty and like rusted and whatever else it's very easy to do like nothing is mechanically difficult is uh, there anyone not... out there who does uh, terrain building tutorials in a Bob Ross style? Uh, not particularly. Uh, there's definitely people. There's a lot more time lapse kind of things going on, and uh, there's definitely uh, no one's coming to mind right now since you put me on the spot. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> just I, I was I was just curious My mind because was, like, rolling through a list, and I was like, I can't even name yeah, anyone right be, now. <laughs> because it because it, it it just I mean just make one video as a spoof for first of April or something like that. Uh, li link link it to a fake Kickstarter. Look, here is my amazing uh, k uh, terrain tutorial where I talk about uh, the happy little brushes and the mountains and the the little critters I am hiding in the terrain. Or well, you have to have someone who has a very smooth voice. Yeah. Uh, well, not exactly. So. <laughs> So it's well, you can have someone with a suave or smooth, cool sounding voice and they can they they can articulate themselves well and explain something. You have to have the enthusiasm with it, because I guarantee you, you subscribe to a handful of painter channels where it's like this guy doesn't even want to paint today. Man, he's like really forcing himself to like grind out content or something. Or like say some company gives you models and you have no interest in them, but now you're obligated because they gave you like two hundred dollars worth of models to go paint those say. Actually, never uh, never ran into that because I'm rarely watching uh, paint f f someone uh, painting fully or painting on Twitch and do that very very rarely. Yeah, and, painting uh, on Twitch seems very difficult to get into compared to standalone videos because people don't want to not as much uh, turn on like oh let's see who's live painting right now. They want to say like I'm looking to paint X model. Where is that? Like they'll look for a specific thing yes that they're painting like how to paint industrial junk garbage terrain. To look that up what's the chance the guy's going to be streaming and always making that like it just seems unless you like a specific painter's personality like oh i like watching like a like the the new girl uh savage work guy that kind of replaced duncan like if you like watching her paint by all means she'll paint awesome random stuff sure 
But uh, if you're looking for, like, I want to watch someone paint drop some Commander miniatures, you're not going to find that on Twitch. You'd have to go to, like, old YouTube videos to find that. Because remember, our hobby is so niche. It's, like, really hard to... It used to be really hard to find content. Now, while it is, quote-unquote, popular and, like, a golden age of Games Workshop and models getting released and quarantine, so everyone's painting inside, there's still not a lot of content out there. Like, it seems like there's, oh, someone did this video a bunch of times, but... Um, like that drop zone table i'm one of like five people i think that built up like the official resin drop zone commander like city buildings and like uh like had an actual table for it that wasn't just the card stock like starter kit buildings yes you're totally right in that regard uh i found that out when i uh started to paint a raging hero miniature and i uh, was l looking who else uh, had painted this very miniature to see how they managed some of the pitfalls of that miniature because it is very detail rich and the detail is very very small mm -hmm. and three hits and two of them probably not usable and the third one more looked like a photoshop coloring so yes uh, so i know what you mean i have a friend that is a so i tried non-metallic metals once and just decided it wasn't for me because i'm i'm kind of like tanner i'm like a firm believer in like hey you have to have a balance of like tabletop quality getting it finished and like like being proud of what you painted you don't have to non-metallic metal everything and I have a few painters that are quote unquote like award winning, they want a golden demon or so. And it's they struggle with like, oh crap, I can't turn it off. I have to paint everything up beautifully to non metallic metal. <laughs> and something fascinating was, uh, and what, uh, what I'm going for here on this tangent is uh, I had one friend that was like, all right, he would look up a model for how to get the reflections correct. And he was painting like war machine models. And he figured out that he couldn't find people that professionally painted some models except the studio. So he'd try and look up like a tutorial on like this or a kingdom death model where he'd be like, yeah, I can only find the studio official one. And like uh, no one else painted it. And he doesn't know how to do the proper like shading and highlighting and like the light source. He's he kind of wants to look at someone else's work so he knows where to place the shadows because he's trying to paint it really nicely. On the other hand, if you want to look up a Space Marine Dreadnought, you could find a thousand of them that are painted in, like, Ultramarine, perfectly, like, blended and highlighted. Oh, yes, and also in different uh, painting styles. Uh, Blanchitsu yeah. uh, springs to mind, or, the, well, the uh, heavy, uh, heavy metal style. Uh, you, you find a lot of that, but as soon as you go to a different manufacturer, it the... the uh, Sources there's, there's, getting there's very very small. You're like, I can't even find non-studio pictures of some models. Like there's some games like that where you're like, I can't even find anyone that actually painted these. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you as a enjoyer of making terrain. Yeah. Was there one of your projects where it was hard to stop? Where you are like, okay, I only have a limited time, but just 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 an hour more or just a half an yeah. hour more i spent about six or seven hours painting roses on my frostgrave table on that games workshop terrain um it's these uh, gardens of more or like the old if you look at my frostgrave stuff uh it's about the start of quarantine or something um that specific table it was a four by four and also i'm the guy in the local area that would like run or run demos so i would get new people into the hobby so for drop zone commander if you came to your local store and you saw that awesome table, you'd be like, oh, this game is amazing. I definitely want to play this, so let me purchase a starter kit or two. Same thing with Frostgrave. I was trying to get people interested, and I was running like a whole local league in the city. And I was like, all right, well, on the smallest table you can play on is a 2x2. Two two. And then the largest table for like a 3- or 4-player game would be like a 4x4. Four four. So that's what I ended up doing. I made a, basically it's four tiles that are 2x2, two two, and then it's this whole uh, gothic kind of looking like graveyard setup and it's fall and autumn themed yes uh, yes i like that okay. one very much the uh, i just was... looking at it tells me that it is a lot it was a lot of fun to do that and the, especially the the, <laughs> the the cracked boards uh this this ch uh, a broken chapel with uh the the autumn leaves on it and uh, uh your necromancers hideout that is gorgeous and that's something where on it like the 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 under 
the underground downstairs thing was a uh, actually that necromancer's hideout was a uh, I ran a painting competition for terrain and that was the example piece of like like tell a story about the piece of terrain that's like the necromancer hides under the ruined cathedral or whatever but um what's interesting with that table was first of all it was I bought the peroxon hot wire cutter and that was my excuse to make a million little bricks that was just a lot of fun but so I had like new toy syndrome where I was like, Ooh, shit, oh, yes, ooh, like new toy. <laughs> so I was like, so you can actually see that Necromancer's hideout at the top of it. That's not the best brick placement. I just cut so many bricks. I was like, we're just Lego. We're just back to these as Legos and glue and just glued up like uh, pretty disorganized piles of bricks. But it was a lot of fun. And that's something where I painted the table gray and did some dry brushing. And I was like, eh, I should call it. I'm done. And I didn't, it wasn't painted to like a good quality. Uh, and that's something where I went back and like re-highlighted all the roses, added some more pigments and like highlighted up some of the metal. However, on the Gardens of Moor terrain, there's like, all of them are plastered. Kind of like, you know how Games Workshop terrain plasters skulls over everything? Oh, yes. This specific set of terrain just has roses everywhere. And it's just like, my options were, I can super glue leaves on top of them so you don't see them, or I can individually highlight a ton of like little roses and you barely notice the detail. However, I had like a night where I was like, let me do all of them. I'm going to triple highlight the roses. This, this was completely not worth the effort, but I was like, this is going to finish it officially in my mind. Yeah. There, so, there is a lot of, okay, I'm going to paint this now and no one else, but me will appreciate this, but I have to do this in this hobby. There are a, a this is I uh, I don't know, a, compulsion or a standard that uh, a lot of people hold themselves hold themselves to that is like okay i cannot leave that this has to be done although there is the only reward is that i know yeah some of my uh, drop zone commander terrain is so small that like no one remote remotely care about the details but it's something for me that was like a oh yeah i made these out of magic the gathering cards that i cut up or something or like this is little pebbles or like the details were so small but it's it's something where i'm i don't know anything you create it's like your personal touch on it and also like if you feel it's complete it might not be perfect but if you feel it's like you've achieved what you envisioned then you're good to go and i mentioned that in like some of my videos where it's like hey you, I had an idea in my mind, and if I can kind of get around that area and finish the project, that's perfect. So, like, I wanted to make that Frostgrave table so I can play with a bunch of friends, and then also I lent it out to friends. So that table travels to different people, uh, players' houses during quarantine right now. Like, I haven't actually seen the table in a year. I basically lent it out locally, and then they pass it around. <laughs> that is... Never heard of that, to be honest. I oh. Because uh, usually... It is stored uh, with the owner or stored well, at the a... store's closing. That was yeah. something where I'm just like, hey, Joe, normally you have D&D at your house. So you know what? How about you hold this, run games out of your house, and then like switch it to other players was the idea behind that. And that's also something where I also didn't have to, oh, I want to get a game of Frostgrave in. Let's go to Steve's place. Like I didn't have to deal with that now because I was already, my whole place was engrossed in the giant 8x4 table I was working on. Do you know where that table is right now? Uh, yeah, I know where it's located. Uh, it's actually getting used in like a D&D stream kind of thing where they set up a camera, they move figures around and uh, like on the stream to show the other players who are playing online. That's uh, It's currently getting used for that, so not actually for Frostgrave because uh, Frostgrave just came out with the second edition that we haven't really changed over to yet. We're still in first edition. Yeah, that is, a, I think, a bit of uh, the great reward of building terrain. It is not uh, tied to a gaming system most of the time. I mean, Drop Zone Commander, clear. It's just tied to the scale. That's yeah, it is like, tied to the scale, yes. Like, uh, that's why, like, I've never jumped into Flames of War, even though I'm like, sure, World War II sounds cool, and I could paint some tanks in that, like, rusted style I have, and I can use grass tufts, and, like, I could do some cool World War II terrain. I just can't use that terrain for anything else. So I'm just like, eh, I'm not into it. Um, you mentioned you were running a campaign. And as I told before, I was, uh, well, I'm still running a kill team campaign with a, a little group, four people. It is uh, now it's uh, six people. The Cruc um, Warhammer Crusade campaign that is be running right now, I think has six to eight people. 
how do you wear the crown of the organizer? What are your experiences and what can you share with the audience? So unlike being a dungeon master, which is like, it feels like you're doing unpaid labor effectively. Um, yes, so very much. <laughs> uh, your players don't think about it. But like when I was a dungeon master, I would uh, pay for the service to make maps called Incarnate. I would like I would like go above and beyond. I would print stuff out. I would get a lighter and like burn different like notes around the edges so it looks cool if I hand it to a player. I'd paint all the miniatures. I make the terrain. It was like forty hours of prep work to do like one session. It was ridiculous. On the other hand, it's that's how I wanted to play D and D, and D and D suffers from that Matt Mercer effect thing and all this. It's whatever you want to play as. So if I want to play a campaign, I know I'm going to do some back breaking stuff to set up for it. But also, my players can show up and show off some nicely painted armies. Like, like it's something where it's I also expect from them, like, hey, uh, I'm going to invite you to this thing. We're going to have some games, put it up on YouTube. I'm going to run a campaign. But it's there's two things: have a nicely painted army, but also it's very beer and pretzels. Where I'm going to actually have like, hey, we're not don't run a tournament list against me. Like, uh, like we're, I have an apocalypse battle possibly planned. Uh, with like a local Blood Angels player where he has like a hundred Primaris Marines that he's been painting for the entire quarantine. He paints like one squad a week. I can have a game against him and it'll make uh, an excuse for me to paint some of the Tyranid Titans, but it'll be like, oh, we're going to set up a completely casual all day event 101 on my table and it's going to be fun. I want it to be fun. Most apocalypse, most large games are not really fun. It's too confusing to all over the place. We're here for the, I want to look at my awesome, cool, like nice painted toys over some terrain, roll some dice, have some heroic storylines. Uh, I don't know. Like, I want to, I want to have the nostalgia, like, like what you assume Warhammer should be, instead of like looking at rules to see what exact stats such and such has with this rule interaction. When my commander drops this stratagem, I just linked to a picture actually that's a little absurd. Uh, one of the lists in my campaign that I'm personally playing is a very underpowered Inquisition list. It's terrible on the tabletop, and I should probably lose every game. However. It's a ton of fun to play, and it's like a mismatch of uh, like inquisitorial stormtroopers, scions, assassins, and different characters, and a bunch of homebrew ruled kind of custom units. It's not remotely effective, but I uh, it'll be like a fun to play like a wacky custom list. And that's the same thing with some of my opponents. They're like, "Hey, I'm gonna run a bane blade against your tyrannids. I'm gonna give it custom rules because I don't like the current one. I don't care. I'm not playing this as a tournament." The people online that view it, I guarantee I'm going to get some guy having a hissy fit in comments of like, they're playing 40k wrong, they're not using the exact unit stats or anything like that. Uh, with the campaign is like the goal for like the six guys or whatever I'm going to invite and we're going to play it with is like, we're trying to have nice looking pictures, but like have a few beers, play the actual game, how you envision you want to play the game. It's not like I'm going to bring a really crazy list and crush Steve in his own in his own house and be like, haha, I won. Like this, this nuts, not <laughs> crush your enemies, <laughs> see them driven before you and hear the lamentation of the women. <laughs> so I think on one tournament ever, I got a top 10 at like a grand tournament where it was more than a hundred people. And the last table to see who won the tournament, I was on table one for the last game. And I was against another local player from my store that we drove hours to go to this other city to play in a convention hall. And I remember the talk we had was like, Let's play the game out and have fun. Well, we ended up tying. So that put us to like seventh and ninth place or something respectively. And you're like, well, technically, if we were like, we wanted to win, we could have been like, all right, you give me the win. I'm going to give you a full massacre. You're going to get bonus points. That means you get oh, first yes, place. Yes. Like, like we had a talk where, and then like we started that talk and then 15 seconds into it, we're like, nah, dude, that was a fun game. Uh, <laughs> you want to get energy drinks? Like, like yeah, are, we, are we doing this? Yeah, nah, I don't but know. We started the talk of like, I don't know, should I give you the full win? Like, do you think your painting score can beat the other guy who also got a perfect win? It was like, it was a weird gray area of like, do you want to win the prize? And it was like, you know what? It's about the, the friends you made along on the journey. <laughs> like, oh, yes, I, it I, is. I think it's like the conversation we had. Yeah, so uh, you having a more casual setup, I think the the greatest problem might be to get a uh, to, well to to get everyone on the right schedule. To yep. uh, so we're gonna probably do like a like a like two games a month or something. Like it's pretty minor, and it's something. Yeah, we can play at a store. We could play at different people's houses, but that's something where. Uh, I have my table specifically, like we're going to probably play a thousand points for like the first few months. 
um, it's going to be pretty small. And then I even have a few friends where it's they don't have a painted army, so like one of them will use my Iron Hand Space Marines or whatever to go play, and that that's kind of them learning to play, and like also they get to field a nicely painted army and play with it, which is a lot of fun. I don't know if you ever borrowed a friend's army, but it feels like an no. absolute treat or a treasure when you're like, oh, I'm playing some guy's pro painted army. This is nice. Uh, well, like, I uh, I lended out my army, and uh, yes, uh, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> uh, I, it depends if it's a good friend or if it's like they're going to an event. But uh, it was it's a fun feeling where it's like, oh, if my models are painted nicely, like they perform better on the table. It's like a weird sense because it's like these are my guys, my army working for me. It's like a weird connection you have with it. Well, the only thing was I did sell off uh, my Warhammer well, Fantasy Demons and okay. uh, a few years later a unit of them uh, reappeared at a local tournament and I was like, hey, I painted those. <laughs> <laughs> I, that... uh, I do have a funny terrain story about that. Uh, the first terrain competition I've ever entered on an old, old form called Terra Genesis. I, uh, I entered a terrain competition uh, entered the deadline late, so I got like disqualified, and it was just I made like a little orc shack or something like that. It was it was uh, I don't know I was in middle school or something like eight or thirteen fourteen, and I was like oh this is this is really fun. I made this. Oh, I didn't win. That's fine. I posted photos of it, and then I remember I gave it to the local store because they had a bunch of like ramshackle orc kind of desert terrain. And what was fascinating was uh, randomly during quarantine, one of the local stores was uh, like just reorganizing their back rooms. And that's something where they like, it was just sitting on a shelf. And I was like, oh man, I painted that like 14 years ago or something wild. That is a blast from the past for sure. And yes. I was amazed that it was in one piece. I was like, this wasn't made durably. This is like white glue <laughs> and like popsicle sticks. Like it was like that kind of like this. And if anyone sat on this, it would break immediately. And I was like, this is amazing. It's still together. Yeah, my turn. It's a a, a um, friend. My turns break all the time. It's the yeah, most durable the, the old ever. the old metal gargoyles, and not not even uh, necessarily the second edition one, but the third edition ones. I was quite happy to have them, but uh, yeah, I think right now two or three are still broken off their flying bases. They actually did something clever and. Um, that you could form the hole uh, at the bottom out of the two wings, which uh, was a good solution compared to just uh, stick it in a stick it in a hole. And uh, most of the time, when you have a metal model, you have to drill the hole out so it actually fits. And yeah, I'm down to talk about Tyranids for a bit if you want to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> but uh, so so for Tyranids specifically, um, I. Uh, all Tyranid players, they're very similar to Chaos players, I think, where they own thousands of points of Tyranids, but they actually don't really field a lot of it. Like, yes, I own 20 metal gargoyles and 20 plastic ones. The effort to actually like bring those to a store or play a game with them, I just never run them. They're just It's just not remotely fun. But my Carnifexes or my Hive Tyrants or like my big giant Tyranid Forge World bugs, it's just very easy to be like, look at this big guy. He's already painted. Let me just field him immediately. It's like, and I kind of understand, so I don't own any Exocrins, actually, even though that's like the main tournament staple kind of unit for a while now. And it's something where, yeah, my friends that are Tyranid players, they pop out their two Exocrins, they got their nine Hive Guard or 20 Zone Thropes or whatever the current uh, goofy fun medalist they have. And it's, it's only, wait, that's a Tyranid army? It's only 30 or 40 models in total. It's barely anything. I, I just, even though it's, almost not feasible it's really fun to run like the combined arms of tyranids where you have tyrants gaunts gene stealers like running a little bit of everything is i don't know like that's kind of how i envisioned the old third and fourth edition kind of tyranids working it doesn't always have to be big bug basically what i was and, playing in third and fourth edition yeah. i think i running uh, 64 Termagants, uh, 24 Gene Stealers, 9 oh, Raveners. Yeah, there were lots of 32 Gaunts used to be. I used to run, yeah. like, the two packs of 32 Gaunts. I used to really like Tervagons during whenever they released them, uh, but before they had a model. Not a fan. To be honest, I'm not a I fan like of any of wise. any Titanic Tyranids or Titans in this game at all, but, uh, yeah. 
li- listeners of this podcast will know. <laughs> I'm, I was just, I don't really like, uh, specifically the, the Exergrins and like Tyrannifex, I despised. I never liked it because it was like, I have this barbed Hyradule, why would I use a Tyrannifex? Like, I don't know. Yeah. So, um, same thing with uh, the normal Carnifexes. I own like nine plus old one eye or whatever. <laughs> Steve. Even though, yeah. We done. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah. We ran that. through an hour. <laughs> that was quick. But well, that's something where I don't know. It's a. I feel like there's a lot we can just like just bounce back and forth about. But, oh uh, yes, I yes. I tried yes. to come into this like really enthused so we can keep it up because I was worried about like how are we gonna burn out and have like quiet. Uh, Actually, like n- so. never never really happened, and a, f- a few of my guests are are waiting for a second round still <laughs> because. I mean, uh, that Love that it. feeling that uh, you could go on and on that is uh, a shared feeling between a lot of my guests. I mean, yeah, that's that's something where we'll probably catch up and talk more and like uh, just about whatever your next terrain projects are. You can feel free to talk to me, but we can jump into all kinds of subjects. And if I, you would allow me to be a guest another time after I give this a bunch of shout outs, that would be great, honestly, to go into a, to appear here a second time. So. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm waiting right now for some time to pass so uh, I can go back to a uh, guest that I had and talk about some entirely new stuff or their experiences. I mean, there's al- always the, the danger that they drop out of the hobby, which can happen, but that yeah, is my plan right back. now. But yeah, all right. So th- thanks, Symbio Joe. And uh, again, this is uh, what is on the tabletop. And uh, I definitely would like a second invite eventually. And uh, maybe when I end up starting getting the narrative campaign going, you can tell me about how yours, your campaign's going to go on for Crusade. And then we can uh, we can just share details on like how rough of a start we both have. <laughs> well, the Crusade campaign is in the hands of someone else. I'm running uh, uh, the Kill Team campaign, and uh, I'm running it with my own... Uh, m- modded rules and soon there will be a translation so i'm if... absolutely with you on any kind of rules edits homebrew mods anything like that honestly just whatever's making the game actually flow correctly so you don't have to crack out a rule book or look at some faq online where some guys on a forum argue about it it's you're supposed to be having fun not stopping the momentum of like what you're doing exactly those are great closing words steve thank you so much for your time Again, you... Joe, this was a lot of fun, and thanks again. Shout out to Tanner if you listen to this whole. Yes, thing. shout out thanks to for, Tanner. Uh, thanks for the connection there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. And, and uh, I say until next time. Thank you very absolutely. much. All Good right, f- man. Have a great rest of your weekend. Yes. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.